I'm Philip. I'm from Vienna, actually. I always describe my city. Vienna is the capital of fatty foods, uh, beautiful architecture, and classical music. <laughs> um, but that's the only way to win anything nowadays. Like, Mozart doesn't help us anymore. Yeah. Um, I work at Elastic, the company doing Elasticsearch, Logsearch, Kibana, Beats, um, previously called the Elk Stack, now we call it the Elastic Stack. But is, that is not the topic today. Like, this is what we will do tomorrow in the full day workshop. Uh, today I will just focus on queues. Um, and I'm at Elastic, I'm working in the infrastructure team, and that is kind of a Unix pipe, I kind of pipe infrastructure work into developer advocacy. So right now is conference season, and I'm out at lots of conferences just doing talks. And every now and then, I'm back at home, and there I run meetups about databases and academic papers, but we try to not make it too academic today, don't worry. Um, so, like, the original topic where we will start is, Previously, before joining Elastic, I worked as mainly the operations person at a small company doing EDI, Electronic inter Data Interchange. And that is kind of like getting stuff from A to B in an automated fashion. And the backstory of that is like there was Berlin like after the war and it was kind of separated by the Soviets and they had to fly in all the goods. And that was kind of the birth of EDI because like, you had lots of goods that had to be delivered in a very short amount of time, and you didn't have much storage facilities, so everything had to be very much optimized. And back then, people started to automate that process, like, what will I send you? Like, people need to order stuff, and then you send them a dispatch advice, like, this is the stuff you will get. And then at some point, you will get it, and maybe you will need to pay for it. And that was kind of the starting point of EDI. And it's this still widely used, so especially in automotive, if you build a car, you need thousands of parts, and you don't have capacity to store like too many of them at one time. So they have this very highly optimized pipeline where they will really just get the spare parts for the next few days, but if one of them runs out, they won't be able to build in another car. Um, so that needs to be highly optimized. Or the same is true for supermarkets. Like every time you buy something in the supermarket, the system knows, okay, you, somebody bought something and I still have that many pieces of it left. And at some point I need to order that new stuff, otherwise bad things will happen. Um, and the two things to that, um, that is just kind of the domain, but we'll jump into domain uh, queues right after that. Uh, the first thing is you normally have, you have transmissions and the message flow. That is just protocols how to yeah, send data around. So think of it like web services or more obscure protocols you just have in that domain, but it doesn't really matter here. Uh, and then you exchange documents. Like yes, XML is kind of new and fancy in that world, everything is very old. And you have, maybe you have heard of Edifact already, it's really old. Uh, and that is kind of the way to exchange documents in a machine readable fashion and just exchange them in a de defined format. And if that fails, terrible stuff will happen. Like this, for example, you, your supermarket will run out of beer. Um, maybe not even that beer, but think of it as proper beer. Like assume like it's proper beer you're running out. So this is kind of the worst case scenario you're facing. And the previous company where I worked, uh, we were exactly in that business. Like we were connecting supermarkets to companies providing the stuff for the supermarket. And we had to make sure like how to get stuff there in time, and they should never run out of things. So what is very important there is messages need to be delivered like not real time, but in a very short amount of time. No messages should get lost, because otherwise there will be no beer. And probably no messages should be sent in like duplications, because if you send something duplicated and it's something that goes bad quickly, like fruit or flowers or something, that's just waste. Like, if you send twice the, the fruit uh, of what you can sell, uh, those will only go bad and you won't gain anything. So this is kind of the setting where we're working. And this is what we want to use queues for. So the general setup is something like this. You have various connectors to different um, protocols and different companies and whatever. And then you just process data coming in. So some order, for example, comes in, you process it, you extract the relevant information, um, and you see, okay, it is for that supermarket, for example, or that vendor of a product, and then you just extract all the relevant information and send the message forward by the same connector or another connector. So it's just different protocols um, connecting each other. And to do that, we were using Apache Camel, 
um, which is rule-based routing and mediation engine. And it's just like very easy to connect everything in Java, but again, this is more of an implementation detail. What is more interesting is like you have a component for one of the protocols. Um, you throw it into a Camel route, which will define, okay, this needs to go to, um, through these stages where we process stuff. Um, it will then store stuff in a queue. It will ta be taken out for processing, put, will be put back into the queue, will be processed again. It's a back and forth between queues. Um, at the end, you just throw it out to the camera routing again, it will be sent out to the world again. So we will be focusing on that queue part. That is kind of the interesting thing. So what queues give you is you decouple producers and consumers. Like, you don't have a one-to-one -one mapping anymore. You can scale them up independently. Um, it can be synchronous or asynchronous. Um, you just decouple two different systems, which is generally a good thing. That is why many people love them, but some people also hate queues because they think they're like the wrong solution or they're not helping you at all. Um, this Ted, he, he's also written some very influential or well-known um, blog posts. And he said like network message queues, like ActiveMQ, RabbitMQ, SerialMQ, and a host of other Java-inspired software tumors are crutches of system design. So he is not really a big fan. He also wrote one of the articles where it was like four or five years ago where he said Node.js is cancer. Um, that's also very nice to read where he implemented something in Node.js and said it's like really a bad idea and you should never do that. Um, so he has very strong opinions and feelings. And one of his strong feelings is pretty much against queues. Um, so his arguments, for example, against queues, why you should not use a queue is um, the blocking consumer. If you have a consumer which consumes something and you block that, you potentially care about the timing. Like as soon as it's not really decoupled and asynchronous, like many people do, yet I just want to have this processed as soon as possible and I'm waiting for it and I will block for it, then you have kind of broken the entire thing a queue should give you. Um, it, uh, you can just do synchronous calls if you block, like there is no advantage in having a queue that is blocking. Um, and if you have peaks you need to get rid of, um, do proper capacity planning. Uh, but blocking consumers are just like the first sign you're using queues the wrong way. Um, collecting data for offline processing. There his argument is a bit more arcane where he says, well, Unix has lots of systems to actually do stuff like that. Uh, so for example, they have syslog to actually ship um, data for offline processing afterwards. And if you do offline data processing, he thinks like queues again don't make any sense. Or they're just adding complexity. Um, especially if you're using a Java-based system, like there is a lot of complexity um, you add. You could just use stuff like simple Unix pipes or write to files or stuff like that. And yeah, there are quotes like that who actually illustrate that problem. Um, I guess everybody knows some of them, like them. Uh, but that shows you exactly what two of the main problems. Um, first, order of delivery is a hard issue with queues and probably not working at all anymore. And guaranteed delivery, what everybody wants is like having a message delivered and processed exactly once. And um, that is a hard problem. That's probably sometimes possible, sometimes it's not even possible. Um, so this is really the problem of queues and what we will dive into. Um, so what do we mean if we say order? Like order should be if you have a distributed system and you want to have a totally ordered system, you want to have it processed as if it was running on a single machine. Um, you can very easily depict that, uh, assume you have three replicas, for example, and you have three operations. Um, a totally ordered system is where all the operations appear exactly in the same time over all the systems. Um, that is a hard problem. Like, it sounds very easy, just running it uh, the same everywhere, but due to network latency um, and you have lots of producers and lots of consumers, this is a very hard problem, like everything, having everything ordered. And the second attribute you really want to have is the exactly once delivery. Like not only delivery, but actually exactly once processing of data. Um, because normally you have two approaches. Uh, once you remove or acknowledge a message, um, you can dial, do it either before processing the message or after processing the message. So before processing is at most once. Um, so 
basically what it is like you have a producer, the producer stuffs messages into the queue, and then you have consumers somewhere. And then consumers, when they take out the message, they acknowledge the message before actually processing it. So they are taking it out, and as soon as they're taking it out, they're saying, okay, message gone, you can delete it now. But what if the process just crashes, like the operating system crashes, somebody pulls the, the power plug, whatever, then the message is just lost. You cannot be sure like it has been processed. So the other approach is then, um, you only acknowledge it after processing the message. Then again, the message might get stuck on that node uh, for quite a long time. For example, you have a big garbage collection, or the network link breaks for some time, and it has actually processed it, and after five minutes, when a network connection is re-established, it, it has processed the message again and will send the result as well. Um, but maybe you have some liveness guarantees, and in the meantime, you have sent the message to another consumer, and he has processed it as well. So then you have the problem that the message might be processed not once, but two, three, or more times. So the basic trade-off you need to make is, do I acknowledge the message before processing or after processing? And depending on which one you choose, you will either have zero or one, or one or more. But there are exactly once it's like a very hard problem to solve here. Um, so what at most once normally requires is you have kind of a strict consistency. Um, so you have the communication overhead. All um, the nodes need to be uh, in, uh, yeah, in a consistent view of your data. And if you have a network split, just the majority of nodes can continue working. So if you have like three nodes and the network in the middle breaks and you have two on one side and one on the other, like only the two nodes which form the majority, they can continue to work because they see each other. But the one single node, it doesn't see the majority of the nodes anymore. Majority of three is two. Um, so it just will stop working and you have lost like one third of your capacity. So that is a trade of like it has overhead and it potentially um, takes away a lot of performance. Um, so at most once it's kind of more expensive. And in many scenarios, um, you want to have at least once, yeah, you really want to have your messages to be processed. So at least once it's easier to distribute, like you just take stuff out. If it is not processed within a certain amount of time, you just take it out again and try to process it a second time, third time, or how many times you have it. Um, you can balance that by having idempotent consumption. Idempotency basically means like you can process it multiple times, but it will not change the outcome. So what you can do instead of if you have, um, for example, if you're counting numbers and you're counting up, instead of saying plus one, plus one is never idempotent. Like if you call plus one, plus one, plus one, uh, your counter will grow and grow and grow. Instead of saying plus one, what you would need to do is stuff like you set the number, like you set it to three. And as long as nobody else is setting the number, you can set it as many times as you want. It won't change the outcome. As long as you always set the number or you count it to three, um, that will stay on the same uh, number. And you can have as many calls as you want. Then at least once totally makes sense if you can counterbalance that. And of course, you will need to tune your timeouts. Like, how long do I need to wait until I try to reprocess uh, a message? Like, what are your liveness guarantees? Like, how long might the message be delayed, um, or how soon do you want to really re-deliver it? Um, and for example, Salvatore Sanfilippo, the, the author of Redis, he wrote a very nice article, which is nearly three years old now, or two and a half, or whatever, uh, about queues and databases. And there he describes exactly these trade-offs, like at least once, at most once, and why queues and databases are just not kind of the same system because databases don't really know about this at least once or at most once trade-offs. Um, so you should not really use a database for queues. Otherwise, you do not make this choice very explicitly. It will be just like a very random approach. And back at my old companies, we kind of cheated. Um, cheating is always nice if it works. Um, we did not need order. Like, it does not matter if you or somebody orders bananas and beers. It does not matter if you order at the producer um, bananas or beers, or beers or bananas. Like, the order of messages in our situation there, it was not necessary. So if you have any requirement you do not need, just get rid of it. It, it will make your life much easier. So since that project did not require ordering, all the queue systems we were looking at, like, we were happy, very happy to say, like, okay, 
no other ring required. Um, our life got just like twice as simple now. Um, and the second thing is uh, we try to cheat again. Um, like when a message comes in, um, we do not only throw it into the queue, but we also persist it in a persistent storage. Um, for historic reasons, we were on AWS, and back then AWS only supported MySQL, no Postgres. It was like years ago. We went with MySQL. And like the thing is, we receive a message, and then at the same time, we will store it in a persistent storage right after receiving it. And we will also add it to the queue. And once it's in the queue, it will be running through our KML processing pipeline, so it will be taken out, something will be changed, it will be put back in, it will be taken out, processed, put back in, and at some point it will be sent out. Um, and then it can be acknowledged. Uh, what our cheating here was, like, we really want to have the at most once approach. Like I said, we really don't want to have the message duplicated a second time, because that is potentially very costly. Like you have a second truck of fruit standing in front of the supermarket, you will probably need to throw that all away. Um, so we won't want to have that. Uh, but since we are cheating, what we have is we can just say, okay, we know all the messages that can uh, come in, and we will then capture the state when they go out again. And like at midnight, or like after a few hours, um, we just run a check. Like everything that has come in between one hour and six hours ago, has that been processed and sent? Otherwise, it probably went missing somewhere in our queue. So the at least once approach, if you lost a message in between there, um, that's fine because we have it in persistent storage and we can just compare like everything that has come in and everything that has been sent out. Like everything that has not run through our entire pipeline but got lost, lost somewhere in the middle, that is probably like the at most once approach. And we can just requeue it and start the process again. Of course, it will be delayed by few hours, but that's normally fine. So this cheating is like why in this project we are leaning towards the at most once approach and not the at least once approach. Uh, just because we can check afterwards, like has it been properly processed? If not, just requeue it and get going again. So this is really the trade-off we selected for that project. Um, so the goals were reliability, system must work. Like, if all the processing start, stops at night, nobody is monitoring at night, and then it should have been processed until the morning, and in the morning, the, the, the producers of stuff, they want to send out their stuff, um, that is not going to work. Like, messages cannot just get stuck indefinitely. We need this reliability. And we need this liveness, like, stuff cannot just get stuck, but just stuff needs, it doesn't need to be real time, but it needs to be something close to real time. Like, you should have a delivery within a few minutes. Some stuff is not that critical, like we had people producing candles and stuff like that. You can ca stock candles like for a long time. But if you have cut flowers or fruit or something like that, that's normally ordered just like the day before. And that's why liveness is kind of an important attribute. And like I described, at most once, we do not want to have it duplicated. We want to have it um, like at most once delivered. And another attribute is uh, since this is machine, machine to machine communication, Machines wait, they are not impatient, and machines will retry if something fails. So if you do not have users, your life is much easier. Get rid of those pesky users, they are not helping you. Um, they're just making everything hard. They will complain if stuff takes longer than two seconds. Um, so again, we had a very nice use case where we just got rid of the, the annoying users, and machines are much easier to handle, and we were building on that. So that is kind of the setting. And now we're jumping into what implementations do we actually have to do that. And since we're using Amazon, um, the first choice is SQS, simple queue service. It's fast, it's reliable, it's managed for you, it scales, um, so it does everything you want. And we thought, well, SQS is great, we're on Amazon. Um, we kind of did the, the happy dance and, and that life was good um, for a short while um, until we really realized um, it is at least once. Like, this is generally the, the Amazon approach. Like, for them, it's always like, do stuff at least once. Um, also, for example, uh, Dynamo, their database, they also have this approach, like, um, rather do stuff too many times than too little. Um, for example, for shopping baskets, they have this feature when you, you shop at Amazon and something breaks. Like, their trade-off is normally just keep shopping and add stuff. It just can never be offline. Just keep adding stuff, and at checkout, even if like all the stuff you have put into your shopping cart at some point kind of got lost, 
try to merge that at checkout. That is what actually Amazon is doing. Like if you have like the system breaks badly in the middle, um, they will just keep adding stuff and they will try to merge it in the end. And the worst case scenario is that they will send you stuff second time. Because what the stuff that Amazon normally sends you is not time critical, it's like books clothing, whatever. So if you receive too much, you will simply tell Amazon, well, you screwed up. I'm just sending that back. I didn't order that. And that's fine. So that is totally their trade-off. Um, but for our company, that was a no-go. And the second thing is, like, the messages back when we started were limited to 64 kilobytes. Uh, by now, it's 256 kilobytes, but still. Um, we were, for example, sending XML messages. And 64 kilobytes is basically a hello world in XML. So that was just not going to work. Like, we need at least a few megabytes for XML messages. Um, so that was no go, a no-go. Um, next up, we went with ActiveMQ. ActiveMQ is very well integrated into KML. Yes and no, the, the Apache logos are always ugly, and it's not really a logo. It's just some, somebody wrote something and then put the uh, uh, Apache feather below it. Um, maybe at some point they will come up with a proper logo, but who knows. Um, they have generally master-slave uh, replication. I think by now they have master-master as well. Um, but back when we started off, uh, they just had master-slave systems. Um, and they had three ways to actually coordinate that. The first one is you have a shared file system. So you have one file system, you write messages there, you take messages from that. You have, for example, two nodes running, and they can, like, one of them is active, and it writes to that shared file system. Um, uh, and it has a log file, and it will need to renew that log file every few seconds. And if it doesn't, the other node, which is just standing by, will see, okay, the log has not been renewed, the other node is probably gone, I need to take over. Uh, and so you have a failover system. Um, the same thing you have for JDBC, you can use just a relational database. Um, or, like one of the newer options is, uh, you can have replicated level DB, but for coordination you will need Zookeeper. And since that was a small company, and I was the only ops person, we didn't want to get LevelDB and Zookeeper and so many other systems. We quickly or shortly thought about shared file systems. Uh, now there is Elastic File System, EFS, which you could use. Back then there was no such thing. Uh, what would have been supported is Gluster with a G at the beginning um, for distributed and shared file systems. But again, this sounded super complicated and we didn't want to run it. So we went with the obvious choice, which was JDBC, since we had MySQL already. So MySQL, again, is kind of the shared medium. You will just store all your messages there, and there will be a, a lock entry, and every few seconds that lock needs to be renewed, otherwise the other node is taking over. And that works in general. We kind of tweaked and fine-tuned our settings quite a lot. Like, we had, like, stuck nodes, and it was kind of a learning process. Uh, we tried to kill nodes, um, block network connections with IP tables, and we tried all, of, all the stuff we could kind of find. And every now and then something new would break, and these were the settings we found that kind of worked well. So we set socket timeouts that worked for us, um, especially last one, use JDBC compliant time zone shift. If your time zones are off anywhere, um, stuff will really badly break otherwise. And so these are kind of the, the settings we found to work for us. Um, so it was working correct, but it was like a chewing gum. So it was not really fast. It was like if you would step on chewing gum and then would be kind of dragging that along. That was always like we felt about ActiveMQ with JDBC because JDBC is just not meant for that. So assume you get one large message in XML and you have two megabytes. Then every time you want to persist something to the queue, you will need to send it to ActiveMQ. ActiveMQ needs to take the message, insert it into it into MySQL database, and only then it can say, okay, I have done, you can continue now. And then on the other side, you will go to ActiveMQ, say, give me the la latest message. ActiveMQ goes to JDBC, or to MySQL, fetches the two megabyte message, and only then you can process it. So MySQL totally gets a bottleneck. It has not been built to throw around like big binaries. Um, don't do it. And the other thing we found out, like we are relying pretty heavily on RDS. Like, we have all our metadata there. The only problem is if RDS fails, you're kind of um, dead twice. It's like pretty much this time, you're falling down and then you're being hit again. Um, because like, we cannot process anything because all the live information should go into RDS or MySQL. And at the same time, our queue is dead as well. So it's kind of, yeah, two hits on the head at the same time and we didn't really want to have that. 
So we were looking for alternatives. One of the alternatives we came up with is Hazelcast. This is getting more and more popular now. Um, it's written in Java. It's, they call themselves an in-memory data grid. They support lots of stuff, like lots of Java data types. It's very easy if you have lots of servers and want to just distribute some variable or something. It is super nice. It can do Hibernate second level caching or general caching for you. Um, it can run queries, MapReduce, um, and it does queues. So for us, this sounded like the perfect solution. Like we can use that totally for our Java applications in general. Um, and we can even use a queue. So in German, we have this term, Eierlegende um, Wollmilchsau, which basically in English means um, egg laying Wollmilchsau. Um, as you can see, it has all the things. Um, it can give you milk, it can give you eggs, it has meat. Um, it does all the things, and that was what Hazelcast kind of was for us. It was this, yeah, egg laying Wollmilchsau. Uh, or I think that the proper English term would be jack of all trades, um, but that's much more boring. Um, so it was great. It does everything for Java. As long as you're in the Java ecosystem, it really does everything for you. It has multi-master high availability, and it was really fast in comparison because everything is just in memory. Um, it's just like you send it over the network um, to one node, and it's good to go. And it will replicate everything in the background, and it just takes care of all your worries, basically. Um, the only thing is we had some bad feelings. Um, very few people actually were using the queue component because it does so many things. Like some are very common use cases and others are not. And like we found hardly anybody who was using it as a queue, which was kind of a warning flag for us. Um, we found some bugs in IP DNS changes. For example, if we killed a node and started a new node and gave it a new um, IP address, um, it would not be picked up. I think that was fixed in some ticket, but was kind of a long-standing issue we had. And at least back then, upgrades were very painful because it uses Java serialization in the background. And that means all the versions need to match. Like you have the client and the servers. And all the versions need to exactly match. Otherwise, it just does not work. So to upgrade was basically a stop the world. Like stop the Hazelcast nodes, deploy a new version of your application with the new client, uh, start new Hazelcast nodes with the new version, and start from zero again. And like that does stop the world. Um, upgrades were kind of painful. And yeah, we didn't really want to have that. And then we ask on the mailing list, um, how is it with at most once, at least once? How does it even behave? Because it's not properly documented in your documentation. And we found the answer not that satisfying because they said, well, at exactly once it dies, it's just a to do. And we were like, well, normally it's like, depends on when do you acknowledge, like before or after, and then will be at least once or at most once. Um, but exactly once is like a super hard problem and this is not just bugs you need to fix. So we didn't have the impression like queues were their core business. Um, so we started looking for alternatives. There's Kafka. Kafka is huge now. Um, everybody in Silicon Valley needs to use Kafka. Like even if you're just writing a Hello World application there, it needs to use Kafka, or at least that's my, my impression. Um, in Silicon Valley, Kafka is the thing. Um, it works. It is especially focused on real-time applications. Uh, but again, it's at least once and not at most once. So we didn't feel like we don't really need uh, this real-time approach. And it just looked pretty complex. Uh, even though, especially if you're getting bigger and bigger and have a very big company, Kafka totally makes sense. And at Elastic, for all the big customers we have there, if they need a queue, everybody is going for Kafka. So this is not against Kafka in general. This is just like for our use case. It did not feel like it was a good match. It just had different priorities and didn't give us the, uh, the attributes we wanted to use. But Kafka in general is a very powerful beast. Um, then there is Kistrel. It was written by Twitter. It looked like the perfect match. It did all the things we wanted. Um, unfortunately, the last release was in 2012. Um, and even back then when we started evaluating like two or three years ago, um, that was kind of obviously that. So OK, we need to pass Kistrel. Next up, we looked at RabbitMQ. Um, RabbitMQ is super nice. You can just connect different bits and pieces, and you can split messages and duplicate them and send them around and combine them again. Our problem was, again, it felt like this was solving another problem. Like, we don't need a middleware. We don't need this splitting and everything. We already have that in Apache Camel. We just need a very simple queue that just does queuing. We don't need to send stuff around and have an entire network and connect stuff. Um, and again, um, messages can be duplicated 
and that was one of the no-goes, so we didn't want to have that. And then there was this queue. Um, it doesn't have a proper logo, but it's still better than the Apache logos. So um, this queue is, um, yeah, Salvatore, the, the author of Redis, um, he at one point in, in a blog post he described, no one tries to use one, N independent Redis nodes uh, and just uses that as a distributed system. And what he built there is he basically took the Redis code and forked it to this queue. Um, yeah, and it's actually pronounced this queue. I, the first time I already called it disk, but it's actually called this queue from queue. Um, is an in-memory distributed job queue. That is just what we were looking for. Um, it's just doing one thing. It's just trying to be a queue and not a middleware or anything else. It has multi-master high availability. It is, has configurable acknowledgement, so you can make it either at least once or at most once. You can just tune that uh, how you want it. And it's very similar to Redis, and we were already using Redis as a cache. Um, as a driver, we started using spinach, uh, which is a scalable Java disk client based on Lectius, which is a scalable Java Redis client. So it's kind of um, very similar to Redis, and both of them are written by a German guy, uh, Mark. By now, I know him pretty well. Uh, he's uh, working for Spring Data by now. So he's working on uh, Spring Data, Redis, Spring Data, Cassandra, um, all of these things. Um, it was a very young project. Um, I think we filed issue seven or something with it, and we had some teething problems, like little children have. Um, we felt the same uh, for that. But in general, he's very responsive, and it worked really well. So that combination of spinach and lettuce we were using very successfully and was like kind of a similar model. Um, and this was then our configuration we wanted to use for our use case. So replication factor once means you just have the data once on all your nodes. So you can have start multiple nodes, and your clients or applications will connect to all of them and just put a message to one of them. And then when you consume it, <clears throat> they're also connecting to all the nodes, and they're saying, okay, there is a new message. I will just take that out. We set a retry time to zero, which basically means do not retry this at all which basically means you have the at most once guarantee. Since you do not have anything duplicated, you just, your message just gets put to one node once, you can consume it from there, and then it's gone again. And we didn't even enable persistency on disk uh, speed, and we don't really need to do it. Like I said, we can just requeue messages in case of the need. Um, so this is all good. There's still this warning on the website. This is beta code and may not be suitable for production use. And yeah, nearly a year ago, um, a release candidate came out. Um, we were using it even before the release candidate ki came out. And that was a super painful time because if there is not even an alpha or beta version, everybody kind of picks a random commit, builds it and runs it. And it's super hard to compare with anybody else what you're doing because everybody's just using some random commit and nobody knows what state everybody else is using. Um, so that was a bad time. As soon as the release candidate came out, like everybody is now using, or most people are using the release candidate now, so it's kind of a base and everybody knows, okay, this is a version, these are the bugs other people have run into, so I probably need to watch out for that. So once you want to use software, at least pick something where there is one defined, even if it's just a release candidate, but one defined version, and not just random commits, otherwise, chaos will follow. Um, the bad thing is um, it has been pretty sleepy. And Salvatore just recently said, well, um, uh, after the end of October, which still is technically true, like it will be true forever, basically, um, he will continue working on it. And he didn't really say uh, the year of after the end of October. So we were hoping for 2016. And, and Redis 4 is out already, yes. Um, and the problem is um, he's working on Redis full time and that is what he's being paid for. And this queue is just like his spare time side project and you can totally feel it. I think the last merged commits are from April and those were just bug fixes by other people. Um, so it felt a bit dead. 
maybe it's not totally dead for the future because Redis now has this module system where they have, can do lots of other stuff. Like uh, Redis, for example, can do full text search now. Not sure how great it is, but they can do full text search as a module. Um, and like his thing is now basically, since he found out that forking the Redis code is kind of a lot of work to maintain that, um, he might want to rewrite this queue as a module for Redis and just have it run with the same guarantees. But nobody really knows um, what is going on there. And back at my old companies, they are now still considering going back to Redis, um, just because that seems to be well maintained. And we don't need to run it ourselves because there is Elastic Cache on AWS, so you have Redis run by Amazon. You just have a few clicks or you can totally automate it with Terraform, Ansible, whatever, and have a cluster running for you and you have no worries about maintaining that, keeping it up and running, monitoring it. Um, so just going back to Redis, even though it's not the perfect queue, uh, might still make sense at the moment. So to wrap up, um, I know nobody now likes queues, but everybody's king in Austria, so that's why I picked that queue picture. Um, and um, yeah, generally, like we said, when you run queues, you need to decide at most once or at least once, depending on when you acknowledge the message. And just to finish off, there are some great tweets. Uh, Kyle Kingsbury, AFER, he is destroying databases and distributed systems like on a professional level by now. And he has recently, or like a few months ago, done some great tweets. Um, stuff people will misuse queues for, and this is kind of a common pattern. Like queues will not improve your throughput. Like this is not what queues do. Um, they do not um, com improve your end-to-end -end latency. They might add more latency. Um, but what they do is they add more capacity once you have an overload. So if you have kind of a peak when, when you have a system running and your consumers on the other side cannot handle that peak, a queue is probably a valid solution. But a queue does not help you if you constantly want to run your consumers over capacity. Then your queue will just fill up over time, and at some point your queue will be full and you will lose messages. Um, but if you want to just uh, get rid of these peaks or yeah, maybe calm down those peaks, um, then a queue is a good solution. Um, yes, queues can improve fault tolerance, um, given that they do not lose messages or cause other trouble. Like, the more systems you have, the more complexity you add again. Um, he is a big fan of Kafka. Um, like, yeah, he was based in Silicon Valley or at, in San Francisco for a long time, so everybody there needs to use Kafka. Um, but it, it is a very solid uh, system, so I don't want to talk badly about Kafka. And yeah, about ordering, that is generally not what queues do. It's, um, the point is, um, if you want to run a system, you want to have it asynchronously. So you have lots of producers, they just throw stuff into queues, and you have lots of consumers potentially, and they take out stuff as they see fit. But that will probably break your ordering. This needs to be okay for your application. Like for our application, it totally was okay. Like having orders in different, uh, or, yeah, in different orders, orders in different orders. Um, um, that is totally doable and fine. But for your application, it might not be. Like, this is a trade-off you need to consciously make. And Jake Krebs, he is actually, he was at LinkedIn, he started Kafka. Um, and of course, he says, well, queues are uh, for request response, where you have actually blocking on the other side. They are basically always a bad idea. Queues should be used for asynchronous stuff. So pub, sub, publish, subscribe, that is kind of just decoupling systems, that works well. And he says like, this is another interesting comparison I haven't seen before, it's like, in Silicon Valley, most people are just um, building fraud applications, so you're building the next Facebook or whatever, like somebody writes some status message and somebody else reads it. So they have kind of simplistic fraud applications, which is a very simplistic view of the world. Um, um, so they don't understand async. Whereas in Europe, it's probably the opposite, like everybody wants to do async and nobody does re request response. And you just need to use queues for the right problems, like if you have async, that is where you should use a queue. If you have something that is uh, synchronous, queues are not there to help you. Um, so that is the stuff we kind of covered. Um, we had this queue, which is nice, but 
I won't say that, but it looks not that lively at the moment. Maybe Redis is, might be a good alternative. And uh, depending on what your language is, you have good integrations to use or abuse uh, Redis as a queue. For example, in, in the Rails world, the Ruby world, there is Sidekick, and there are lots of other implementations where you can use Redis as a queue very easily. Um, ActiveMQ is if you have like a very heavyweight Java system, that's maybe a good idea. Or if you use JMS in Java, that is where ActiveMQ really shines. If you don't have that, it's probably not that great. Kafka is great for real-time applications and if you really want to go big, though it is a bit complex. Um, RabbitMQ is more like the middleware approach, but it's also very fast and should scale up also quite nicely. Hazelcast is just, if you're using Java and you want to use one tool that does everything for you, like caching, queues, distributed data types, um, that is where Hazelcast shines. And SQS is really, you don't want to care for it, you just want a service, um, you want to have it run, and you can live with the at least once uh, and the size limits. If those limits hold true for you, that is totally doable for you. That's it. I think we have five minutes or so left for questions. Oh, and if you want to have stickers, there are lots of elastic stickers over there, so if you want to grab any of those later, feel free. So, any Slido questions or any live Yeah, we actually questions? have two, two Slido, well, one Slido command and one Slido question. Uh, one command is that SQS actually is supporting up to two gigabytes now. Ah, yeah, they changed it again, but that is only, I think that is only on S3, right? That is not in SQS directly, but it is basically a link to Amazon S3, and there you can store your two gigabytes. So I'm, like, time-wise, I'm not sure how, how well that performs. Uh, yeah, and you always need to throw it over to S3. So technically, maybe it's, it's not, not possible. Um, I've never used it that way. But I think, like, the, the stuff you can store in SQS is still limited to something smaller, but I think it's just a link to S3, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, okay. Questions start to appear. Uh, so, another question, uh, what are the possible dissyncs uh, and their outcomes? I'm not sure I understand that, but maybe you do. M maybe, could you? Wh which one are this one? dissyncs? Um, maybe the guy who asked the question can, can uh, well, sounds kind of anonymous, so I... the way how we use this queue that, that was not okay, specific yeah. to Redis, but you can use it with Redis a, a, as well uh, at the same time. The question is basically, uh, if you're not having any persistence or message replication, uh, how is handle the exception, well, how is the exception handling done and how you are right, right. So one delivery? You mean a node crashes and loses all the messages it has yeah. on it, and it doesn't have the replicated. Um, so I just got it like, uh, once the message commits in, uh, we normally just store it to uh, MySQL in the beginning, like the raw message. Okay, so that setup is still valid? Yeah, that setup is still valid. Okay. We are still using that. So we are still persisting in that beginning, then we're processing it through the pipeline, and then we're sending it out. And like after half an hour or so, we just check like in the last hour, did all the messages that come in go out again? And if that number does not match, we, we have a fancier admin tool and UI where we can actually see that. Uh, we just have a button and then we can say, requeue this message. But we, I cannot recall that we have ever lost a single message, I must admit. But it would, like we have tested it, it's totally doable if we just kill the queue and it had messages. Um, we can just click one button or like can just have checkboxes and say all these messages, requeue them, and that totally works. Um, or this is also like if we have a bug in our application, which is much more common, and something breaks or the message uh, we just process it the wrong way, and then it's just like in a broken state, we can actually process or push out the app quickly and then resend it through the entire stack. So that is, um, I mean, CQRS, it's not really a CQRS, uh, but that is kind of a similar approach where you can just reprocess a message afterwards. And that is kind of like a very nice attribute if you have a broken application, because everybody has a broken application. Nothing is bug free. 
So we wanted to approve. Does that answer the question? More or less. More or less, okay. Yeah, I have three, three more questions actually. Uh, first of all, why camel plus Q? Why not RabbitMQ? Because it does it all. Yes. Um, well, like, I, I, you kind of answered that in your presentation. But. Yeah, it's kind of a historic reasons. We had lots of experience uh, with camel. And what Camel really gives you is with Camel you have these connectors. So Camel has a component for IMAP. Camel has an SMTP connection. Camel can do REST. So Camel is not just the middleware, but it's also like exposing the endpoints. That is kind of what we, how we connect to external services as well. And yeah, we, we knew it, we started with it, and then it was kind of too late for Rabbit. Uh, but if you're not using Java, and if you don't need these external connectors, you can build your entire middleware with uh, Reddit, of course. Like, that is valid. But you know, once you start using something uh, to rewrite everything, it's probably not worth it. And we never cons really considered it, admittedly. Yeah, uh, another question. Did you try to rethink architecture to use at least once in delivery? <laughs> not really. Because the problem is, again, we, we didn't really there is no unique identifier where we can just, before sending it out, we could just say, okay, this is like a duplicate. So we didn't really know a, a way to filter out duplicates. And if you cannot filter out duplicates, um, we would always have this problem, like the other side doesn't know the message is a duplicate. So they will send the stuff a second time. And for candles, it's fine. If you need, just need to find some storage somewhere. Um, but for yeah, goods that go bad quickly, uh, that is probably not that great. And for example, we had once the case where we had a bug in our application and lost the message, and we knew somewhere in Germany there is a truck standing full of candles and wants to be unloaded. <laughs> but it was Saturday and we know nobody wants to do that today, um, and we had until Monday to actually fix the bug and then give them the, the, the message like, hey, the truck is standing in front of the supermarket, you, you need to unload it now. Um, so we can very much live with that, like we can have rather a bit of a delay and a lost message than a duplicate message. Yeah, and last question, uh, more related to your current employer. Uh, will or is any component of Alex stack supporting natively queuing or caching? Or ah, yes, so, uh, sorry, queuing? Uh, so for oh, queuing, I think queuing is. Yeah, so for queuing, uh, the two Common approaches for queuing with the Elastic Stack is Redis for the small ones and Kafka for the big ones. Like all the small ones are kind of using Redis to as a queue, and all the big ones use Kafka. And it's a very common approach. We have blog posts on it. Just if you think you're very big or you want to have the complexity, use Kafka. Otherwise, stick with Redis. Um, that's what everybody else is doing. Oh, before you leave, um, I wanted to take a picture with you. <laughs> Yeah, let's let's see if I can. I want to do it. Yeah, <laughs> everybody smile. Wave. Wait, 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 wait. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.